Now for your next session, I am absolutely delighted to uh, to give you Rory Sutherland uh, to invite him to the stage. Now Rory is the Vice Chairman and Executive Creative Director of Advertising for the, oh, I've forgotten how you say it, I'm sorry, thank you, Ogilvy. I, I was going to give it a go and then I just knew it would, it would end badly. Ogilvy Group. Now um, Rory is one of the most well-known and sought-after marketing experts in the UK uh, and you are about to see why. Uh, he has a number of wildly successful TED Talks uh, to his name and is famed for the insights into what drives human behavior and how organizations can effectively tap into our motivations as individuals. Uh, he also uh, told me that one of the naked women dancing in the opening sequence to a Bond film is his third cousin. Um, there we go. Um, but today <laughs> he's talking on how his advertising is so efficient that it no longer works. Please welcome to the stage Rory Sutherland. Thank you very much. I obviously didn't tell you which one, as it would have just been obvious from the genetic resemblance, I would have thought. Um, I don't know how many of you have been watching on BBC4 the recent uh, ten-part American series on the Vietnam War. Anybody? Uh, absolutely fantastic. You can watch it on, uh, you can catch up on iPlayer. And it's been a ten-year um, labour of love to produce this extraordinary documentary uh, from the very beginnings to the end of the Vietnam conflict which is a really, really interesting study, apart from anybody who's interested in just combat in general. It's a really, really interesting study in how really, really intelligent people can end up making really dumb decisions. And one of the things that can most wrong foot people is falling in love with a particular metric. And that's the assumption that what you can measure somehow must be important. And the dangerous thing, I think, in a lot of life is that there are important things and there are things that are easy to measure, but the correlation between the two may not be all that great. And one of the problems I noticed in about episode five of this season is all the military guys, because they were obsessed with reporting upwards what they were doing. In some ways, I suspect, if you'd left the conflict to the people on the ground, it probably could have been over with in about three years. Because of the need to report information, you have to report information that can be aggregated. And in order to be aggregatable, it's got to be numerical. And a lot of incredibly important information, particularly to do with attitudes and hearts and minds, doesn't have an SI unit or a mathematical measure attached to it. So they, particularly at the top, people um, uh, you know, like McNamara, extraordinary bright people, became obsessed with the body count. And because they were encouraged by the ratio of the body count, they missed a really, really important thing, which is they thought that the more bodies that you'd effectively created, the better you were doing. What they missed was a very simple fact. If you killed one VC, you had one less VC to contend with. Every time you killed an innocent civilian, however, which appeared exactly the same on the body count, you created 10 new VC. And so they, the obsession with metrics, particularly as the higher up an organization you get, the more preoccupied you are with self-justification, the more you deal with aggregate information, and the kind of information that aggregates may not be the best information. Now, I'll come on to a bit more of this later, and it's one of the things that concerns me about the digital world, that actually the digital world is in many ways a mathematical world, and it thrives on models which may or may not bear a very close resemblance to real human reality. Sometimes it does, in which case, great. But a lot of the time, what you can measure and what matters may be almost, well, actually, they may be diametrically opposed in some cases. So what I'm just talking about today, this is what I've tried to do um, as far as Ogilvy change goes. I've tried to, I, by the way, I know some of the earlier speakers fall back in love with humanity as a fantastic uh, call to arms, I think. I've also tried to look at something which is, I think ad agencies, creative agencies have made a mistake because they've, like everybody else, they've become preoccupied with the technology and lost touch with the humanity. And my view is an advertising agency, a creative agency, suffers from this enormous problem, which is that people only come and talk to us about problems when they have a media budget. Now, I'd argue that for every person with a media budget, there are 100 people with a psychological problem that 
a combination of human insight and creativity might solve who never come and talk to us. We're no longer paid on commission. We haven't been paid on media commission for about 25 years, to any significant extent. Yet the ad industry still behaves as though it is. It regards any solution which doesn't involve a bought media component as somehow invalid. And when it gets a problem, its first thought is, how can we translate this into uh, a solution which involves giving some money to Rupert Murdoch? And my contention is, there are tons and tons of problems you can solve. The NAD agency actually is a bit like a general hospital, but it has a sign out front that says cosmetic surgery. You know, we only get within our portals 5% of the people we need to be talking to because there are hundreds of problems that can be solved with a mixture of better human insight and creative imaginative solutions. Just to give one example of something we're working on at the moment, um, uh, th how to stop people at airports trying to carry water uh, through the security lane. Everybody knows this, but the number of people who basically try and wing it with a bottle of Avian in their hand luggage hasn't significantly decreased in eight years, despite the fact that awareness of the rule has presumably been going up and up. We think, by the way, it's a product of the choice architecture that once you're in a queue and you have a clamshell piece of luggage, because over the last 10 to 15 years, as low-cost airlines have started charging for checked-in luggage, pra practically everybody who flies more than once every two years has acquired one of those clamshell, maximum size, carry-on bits of luggage. One attribute of those pieces of luggage is it's impossible to open them in public without spilling your underwear all over the floor. <laughs> so one of our simplest solutions to this does not involve getting any money to Rupert Murdoch. It says, put some tables in the run-up to the security lane so that people who know they've got a bottle of water in it can actually retrieve it without hideous embarrassment. You know, an awful lot of behavior is driven not by information, not by persuasion, it's just driven by the environment in which people find themselves. That's one of them. There are about five other solutions we've looked at. But what's patently the case is this isn't a case of awareness. This is a case of something about the environment, something about the choice architecture is driving people to behave in the wrong way. What we also do is we look at extraordinary things about what we call innovation. Now, innovation is spelled E I N N E R, vation. It's a close relative of innovation, but it works slightly differently. Innovation is where you innovate not by doing something new in the physical world, but by doing something differently within the brain. So you can create something within the brain without necessarily creating it in, the, in reality. I'll give you an example of that, by the way. That yellow um, is totally an optical illusion. Uh, I assume this is an RGB pixelated screen. Uh, there aren't any yellow indicators. They're all red, green, and blue. Did you know this, by the way? LCD screens, RGB screens are species specific. Anybody know that? They, they're designed to work with humans. If you were a bird looking at that, you'd think it was a shit representation of reality. Humans just have red, green, and blue cones that detect color. And the screen, unlike birds, which have ultraviolet detection, but they don't detect red. I think, it's, I think I'm right in saying that. I mean, there's some things like shrimp, which can detect 16 types of wave, wavelength. If you produced a screen for a shrimp, it would be a really complicated thing to do. Okay. This is a hack. There's no yellow. All it does is mix red and green in a mixture which your brain associates with the color yellow, and the color yellow is not created there remotely on the screen. It's created entirely in your head. Our contention is you can create value, you can create great experiences in the head without doing much to reality. Now, one of the things that drives me nuts when I go to digital conferences is there's always someone there with a really, really sophisticated technological solution. And they say, well, we've got something. What are those things called you have in shops, which are like, you know, which basically sort of Bluetooth things. They're called beacons. Is that right? And there's always a guy who has this really clever beacon solution, which detects when you have a past customer walking with 100 yards of the shop. And you go, this is really interesting. I'm intrigued by this. Contextual communication is useful. And they always say, so the great thing is you can serve them a 20% off offer. I kind of go, look, 
I don't need a PhD to help me sell things by dropping the price, okay? If you want to, if you want to find someone who can sell things by dropping the price, just go to a car boot sale. Don't go to Harvard, right? Any fucking idiot can sell things by dropping the price. The art of marketing is surely to charge more for the same thing by making it seem better, okay? Now, the vital thing here is to realize that you can do this. You can synthesize, just as you can synthesize yellow in the human head, you can synthesize value in the human brain. And the best example of this, my favorite ad of the last three years, one of my two favorite ads, was an announcement by an EasyJet pilot. Come into land, you know that feeling where your plane draws up about a mile from the terminal, and you hear the engines wind down, and everybody on the plane thinks to themselves silently, oh shit, it's gonna be a bus. You know that feeling, right? You kind of paid for the flight, and you're, you're just expecting to taxi to the bloody terminal, and then the plane stops a mile away, and everybody goes, oh shit, it's a bus, right? And I was experiencing exactly that same emotion. But the pilot was a basic genius. He, he gave an example of a piece of fantastic innovation. Because this is what he said. He said, I've got some bad news and some good news. By the way, this is always a very good way of creating innovation. If you look at a lot of great advertising end lines, good things come to those who wait, you either love it or you hate it, reassuringly expensive, naughty but nice. A lot of great advertising end lines, we're number two so we try harder, have that yes but in them. It's a very clever trick because what the human does when you're presented with bad news and good news is to minimize regret, you disproportionately focus on the good news to cheer yourself up, okay? Really, really worthwhile. I, I've, I've actually gone to the government with this and said, look, part of the problem of a lot of things government does, tax, for example, is there's no upside. If you created a tiny upside to tax, like you got a badge, okay? <laughs> um, my own suggestion that higher rate taxpayers should be allowed to drive in the bus lanes was, was rejected, but there we go. I'll try again. If there were a tiny upside, we can make ourselves much happier. Things like speeding tickets and tax make us disproportionately angry. There are people who've gone to jail for five years who can tell a positive story about it. They go, it was a formative experience. I met a lot of interesting people I never would have met, okay? You can, there are a lot of appalling experiences where you can tell the upside story. But with something like tax or, nobody provides the upside story. The pilot did. He said, I've got some bad news and some good news, he said. The bad news is that we haven't been able to get an air bridge because there's a plane blocking the gate. But the good news is the bus will take you right next to passport control so you won't have far to walk to collect your bags. And a couple of us looked at each other and went, shit, that's, that's always true, isn't it? When you have a bus, it takes you right next to passport control. You don't have to walk you know, 400 yards through a kind of crap version of blue water before you can get to passport control. The bus takes you right next to passport. Well, actually, I've got, I've got quite a heavy bag. I'm glad there's a bus. And just by changing what people focus on, you can make people, you can make something that people thought was shit seem good, okay? Shakespeare said the same thing. You know, what is it, there's no such thing as good or bad, but only thinking makes it so. Shakespeare spotted that. Um, you could argue there are loads and loads of, uh, I mean, fantastically, by the way, you can make people pay for things which are a downside. If you buy a Ferrari, they'll deliver it for free to your local Ferrari dealership, apparently. Or you can pay 500 pounds, have a tour of the factory in Maranello, which you travel to at your own expense, and then drive the car home. Now, I don't know if you noticed that, but by framing it as a tour of the factory, they've got you to pay to collect your own car. Okay? Now, things aren't cheap. I mentioned that thing about we'll give them a 20% discount. You can make things cheaper through innovation. Who's got an espresso machine here? Okay? I've got one, love it, love it like a child. It is, in fact, insanely expensive. If you had to buy an espresso coffee in a jar, like Nescafe, for an equivalent dosage of caffeine, a jar of caffeine, a, a jar of Nespresso, if you bought it in a jar, would cost about 70 quid. And you'd look at it next to the Nest Cafe and go, this is completely bonkers. It's not just me, these aren't voices in my head, are they? Okay, I was just, just gonna go, okay, right. Uh, 
I, I, I just wanted to check. Okay, thanks. You, you reassured me. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, now, the fascinating thing is, you couldn't, you couldn't buy it. If you looked at a jar of coffee costing 70 quid, you couldn't buy it. You go, this is just insane. But it doesn't come in a jar, it comes in a pod, which gives you an individual dose of espresso coffee. So your frame of reference isn't Nescafe, it's Starbucks. And you put the 29p pod into your espresso machine, and you think, well, it's 29p, well, that would cost me £2.20 at Starbucks. This machine's practically making me money. <laughs> uh, Rolls-Royce and Maserati made their cars cheaper through innovation. They stopped exhibiting them at car shows, where they look expensive, and they started exhibiting them at yacht and plane shows. If you've been looking at Learjets, Gulfstreams, and Sunseekers all afternoon, a 250,000 euro car is an impulse buy, okay? <laughs> um, by the way, if you allow people to pay for something contactlessly, it feels 15% cheaper, by the way. So innovation is a really important thing. I would argue that Uber is very largely an innovation. Despite, regardless of what people talk about it as disruption, you know, economic model, blah, 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 blah. The reason it disrupted was not because it got you a car quicker, but because of a very simple thing. Just as the human brain has um, actually can't actually, you don't produce yellow, but you can generate yellow. You can reduce wait time, not by reducing it, but by reducing the uncertainty of it. The thing that was appalling about minicabs, apart from the fact they always lied about how long they're gonna take, I mean, this is a very simple thing. The single thing the London Transport did that most improved passenger satisfaction per pound spent wasn't faster, more frequent trains, it was dot matrix displays on the platform. We're happier waiting 90 mi nine minutes for a train knowing that it's going to take nine minutes than waiting five minutes for a train in a state of uncertainty. We really, really hate uncertainty, okay? When you look at queuing, there are about nine psychological factors that affect people's experience of a queue, which are not the duration they have to wait. Worst thing you can do is have a queue alongside your queue, which is moving faster than yours is, okay? Anybody stuck in traffic knows the same phenomenon, okay? What Uber did is it allowed you to basically order a car and then you could tell yourself a story. Oh, you go, oh, look. Now, whereas with a minicab, it'd be, where the hell is this guy? I'll go out in the rain, I'll look around. Maybe he's already arrived. Maybe he's parked around the corner. I'll go out in the rain looking like an idiot and see if I can find our minicab. Oh, God, he's not here. Maybe he's already left, okay? With Uber, you could look at the screen and go, oh, look, he's stuck at those traffic lights. I'll have another pint, okay? There were other emotional benefits to Uber, I think. I think there's a small ego benefit, which is, does anybody else do this, where you time your arrival onto the pavement to coincide with the arrival of the car? Because that makes you feel like Kaiser Soze at the end of The Usual Suspects. You, know, you come out of the police station and a car draws up. You, know, you feel like Louis XIV, you feel great. I also think the fact that you didn't have to pay and fart about with a wallet, the fact that you just got out of the car and said thanks, and that the receipt was emailed to you, made it feel like a service and not like a transaction. But I think the real value, I, I've just written a piece in The Spectator, by the way, which says that actually, Transport for London is very, very silly being nasty to Uber, because Uber is actually incredibly valuable to people even when they don't use it. I'm much more likely to take a train now because Uber exists, because I know there's a plan B, a fallback position, okay? Previously, if you got stuck in the wrong part of London at one o'clock on Saturday morning, I mean, you know, you, you're basically completely stuffed, okay? So a lot of the time, I used to drive into London not to take my car in as a form of transport, but as a kind of fallback position, which is I need to have a car there just in case. I, last year, I made 40 fewer journeys into London than I did the year before, largely because of the existence of Uber, and yet, instead of those journeys, I only used Uber to get home once was knowing it was there that made the difference. So generally in human behavior, there's much more subtlety going on than economics and standard mathematical models really understand. So the trick for innovation is, as I said, look for things which are objectively similar but subjectively different. The right mixture of red and green is the same as yellow, okay? As far as the brain's concerned, so the right mixture of red and green on that screen creates yellow even though there are no yellow producing LEDs on the screen. Similarly, nature's been doing this for a few million years. The chili, by the way, isn't actually hot. Do you know this? 
The chili wants to be eaten, if I'm right, it wants to be eaten by parrots, but not by insects and not by mammals because the parrot spread its seeds further afield, I imagine. Parrots aren't sensitive to capsaicin. Humans and some insects are. I think I've got this right. But if there are any, seriously, if there are any you know, really good uh, botanists or zoologists in the audience, come and tell me afterwards. There's nothing hot about a chili. It doesn't burn your mouth or indeed other parts of your digestive tract because it's hot. It actually hacks perception. Capsaicin makes your sensors in your mouth hypersensitive to heat, so anything that comes into contact th with them in association with chili feels really, really hot. So it's actually changing its total innovation. It's changing the way we perceive something rather than changing the reality. And I'd just like to I'll show this film just to give you an example of this. Depending on how something is presented, you can make something brilliant seem absolutely terrible, and you can make something pretty bad, as Ferrari did, did seem brilliant. And that's why marketing isn't an optional extra. It isn't added value. It's an intrinsic part of the value of anything, unless you're a Marxist and you believe there's some weird objective labor-based theory of value, which probably a couple of you do. OK, that's fine, um, right? But if you accept that value is subjective, there are two things which determine value effectively. How it's perceived is a factor of not only what it is, but how it's presented. And there's no escaping that. Now, I always wanted an example of something absolutely brilliant, which was terribly presented. I used to use a theoretical example, which was a restaurant serving Michelin-starred food, but which smelt of sewage. OK? Yeah, it, now, what tends to happen there? If you assume that we've got to improve objective reality, you go, we must make the food even better. No, get rid of the smell. Okay? But equally, I managed to find an even better example of this from two Australian comedians who took the hottest property in the entertainment world at the time, and probably now as well, and presented it in a way that did not inspire trust or belief or conviction. And this is what they did. Hello. Hi. Whee! Peep shows. They have a pretty bad name, normally associated with lewd content, but by definition, they don't have to be. So in an attempt to change that, we took one of the world's biggest performing artists, kept all his clothes on, and set up an Ed Sheeran peep show. Would anyone dare to believe what was written outside and come in to our very dodgy looking venue? How are you feeling? I don't really know what's going on to you. <laughs> That was fair enough, because we dressed Hamish as a fairly shady-looking spruker in charge of getting customers. I got you Sheeran. Who wants some Sheeran? All right, I can hear Hamish. Do you think I we'll should... get anyone? I don't think we'll get anyone. <laughs> it's going to be a brave soul. I wouldn't, I wouldn't come into if there was a dude with a beard with a hat and say, like, come in and see this. Ed was right. This was going to be tough. You want to peep at Ed Sheeran for two bucks? Insurance. Do you want to peep at Ed Sheeran? Your loss. What do you reckon, big fella? Got Ed Sheeran in here. Beautiful ginger head man. Sitting on a stool. What do you reckon? Two bucks. Got Ed Sheeran just sitting on a stool in there. You want him? Two bucks. Two bucks for a peep. Think about it. It's actually pretty good value. Despite trying, we'd had a total lack of interest for over 50 minutes. It's been some time. <laughs> <laughs> we should have got you a more comfy chair, I think. Yeah. I'm all right. I'm all right. Hey, big fella, got all the Sheeran you need in there. Two bucks. All the Ed Sheeran you need. All the what? Ed Sheeran. Oh, I don't know what that is. He's a singer. Yeah? Is that a yes? No? I think one of the big problems is people think Ed Sheeran's a code word for a new drug. How's it going? You guys like Ed Sheeran? Two bucks. Two bucks for a 30 second peep. No, I... What, like, are they just saying no? Yeah. Category. Dirt cheap peep. Dirt cheap peep. Here we go. Two bucks. Do you reckon we're pricing it too high? And that's why we're not getting people coming in. I think two dollars is pretty fair. <laughs> Here we go, boys. It's a Friday. Get you a cheer and peep show. Two bucks. Sitting on a stool. Play your song. If someone actually does think it's a peep show, I might quickly give you the go-ahead to take off all your clothes. Are you willing to do that? Uh, been drinking a lot of beer recently. Oh, right. Yeah. You're not? A couple of months ago, maybe, but yep. yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in shape. It's just the shape of a potato. <laughs> Two hours in, 
and Hamish was getting more desperate. Stage. Ed Sheeran is literally sitting in there on the stage waiting for your $2. We were feeling it as well, <sighs> but just when we thought this had been a giant waste of everyone's time. You guys like Ed Sheeran? I love it. You love Ed Sheeran? Love two it. bucks, peep show. Just got him sitting on stage in there. This one was good. Are you lying? Well, two bucks. Are you gonna, true? It's gonna cost you two bucks. You only get 30 seconds though. You wanna come in? I Mate. don't believe you. Well, I was the only one way to find out. We might be on here. Here we go, Ed Sheeran Peep Show. He's there till midday. All right, your choice. No, she did the smart thing and walked away. <laughs> Listen, if you, if you guys want to, I'm just saying, if you guys want to have a go, he's sitting in there by himself, it'll probably get busy later on. Two bucks, 30 seconds. I mean, you both can come if you want. Just two bucks ahead. Everything's above board, I can assure you. I'm gonna get uh, no, nah, absolutely not. Like, I can't guarantee what it'll do, but uh, yeah, it's about your two bucks. And after two hours and 23 minutes, including some final hesitation, we finally found people brave enough to take a peek. Did you guys go to peep shows a lot, or? No, oh, f me. <laughs> there you go, man. Keep your clothes on, stay on the seat, behave yourselves. No. Just listen to the announcement, have a good one. Enjoy your peep. Hello, and welcome to the peep show. Your time will start in five seconds. I'm actually a bit scared. Oh, it's night. Well, I'll be loving you till we're 17. Baby, my heart still for that heart of 23. And I'm thinking about how people fall in love. Thank you very much. Alright guys. Now that's partly funny. Okay. But it's a by the way, I think that's pretty much how it feels if you're a financial services marketer at the moment. Because it doesn't matter how objectively good your product is, if you don't have basic trust, if you if you can't manage to create that idea which is this is probably gonna be okay. Okay? And I would argue the whole sector, regardless of you know, merit or, 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 or desert, really suffers from a huge shortage of trust. That's what ultimately happens. Now, notice here that the first thing they start, when they start failing, what's their default? Maybe we're pricing it too high. Okay? Now, one of the things that will worry me most about algorithms is they'll automatically start testing the price of things rather than the other psychological factors which may cause people to buy. Now, interestingly, when he finally persuades that couple to go in, he uses two or three really well-known, tested techniques of human behavioral science. He says, scarcity value, it'll probably get pretty busy later on. He's only there till midday. You both can come in, etc." Okay. Now, those things basically work. Okay. Those of us, I've been studying behavioral science for 15 years. When I am on an air airport airline website and it says only four seats left at this price, okay, I know exactly what they're doing. They're trying to exploit my scarcity bias, but I still buy the bloody tickets. So what's important about this is it can also be used to solve really, really big problems. This isn't just your typical brand manager's problem. Uh, the overprescription of antibiotics has been solved through behavioral science, which is a post-dated prescription. Essentially, you give people a bit of paper, which is a prescription for antibiotics, they leave the GP completely happy because they got a bit of paper. I think 80% of the people given a post-dated prescription don't actually cash it in for the antibiotics. If you give people a prescription and say, don't take this until Friday, what they do is they pass the chemist on the way home. They get the antibiotics anyway because they're planning to go home and wrap up in a duvet. They spend eight quid on their um, prescription charge, and sunk cost bias means, well, I've spent the eight quid, I might as well start taking the pills. If you just post-date the prescription. I've got an e uh, even more controversial theory with the NHS, which is you could reduce unnecessary visits to GPs by about 50 or 60 percent by just having an answer phone message which lists the three most common ailments that people are suffering from at that time. Now, psychologically, why do you go to the doctor? Now, the logical answer is we go to the doctor to get well, okay? 90 percent of the reason we go to the doctor is to be reassured. Fair? Okay? When you have an illness, what's the best thing the doctor can ever say to you in terms of reassurance? There's a lot of it about, okay? You immediately feel fine, right? 
It's rather like when there's a power cut. What do you do when there's a power cut? You go out on the street, and when you see all the other lights are off on the street, you go, oh, thank fuck for that. Okay? It's not just my problem, it's a shared problem. I can relax. Right? What's the worst thing a doctor can say to you? This is an extraordinary condition. I've never seen anything like it before. That's the one thing you don't want to hear from the doctor. So if you had an answer phone message, or a, an, an on wait message, an on hold message at the surgery, which just said, these are the common viral conditions that are going around at the moment, my hunch is that two thirds of the people wouldn't bother going in at all. They'd just go, oh, I've got that. I think also choice architecture, understanding human psychology can solve really big problems like the question of diversity and recruitment. Okay? An awful lot of the problem with diversity probably isn't due to conventional prejudice, it's due to a thing called status quo bias, which is if you're making one decision, you go very, very close to the expected boring norm. There's a solution to that. If you hire people in groups, Without any bidding whatsoever, people will automatically make diverse hiring decisions. Because now they're looking for complementary skills. They do this instinctively. When everybody had one car per household, everybody had a saloon car. Because it was like right close to the kind of middle, default, boring, unusual in no dimensions thing. Once people bought two cars per household, they had two completely different cars, and probably neither of them was a saloon car. So just by changing the way that choices are made, you can completely transform the decisions that people make. That's another example of innovation. Bigger still, one of my problems with maths, and I've been speaking to some good mathematicians about this, is that when you multiply two things together, or you add two things together, you lose information. Because actually, I was just talking to a taxi driver about this on the way here. Now, what does Amazon Prime do? It encourages you to buy lots and lots of things from Amazon because you make one payment, and then all your subsequent payments, all your subsequent delivery charges from Amazon Prime are free, right? That's designed to encourage you to make lots of, one person can make. Now, why does Amazon Prime have to exist? And the answer is because one times seven isn't the same as seven times one. Seven people buying one thing a month probably don't care about a delivery charge. One person buying seven things a month, he's not going to buy the fifth, sixth, and seventh thing from Amazon because he's already spent 12 quid on bloody delivery, and that's the limit. Fair? OK? Now, actually, if you wanted to make the congestion charge more psychologically effective, you'd make everybody's first three journeys into London free, then the next five journeys are 10 quid, and after that it starts going up. You do the opposite of Amazon Prime. But they haven't, because the congestion charge treats seven people going in once the same as one person going in seven times. So it's not optimized to change behavior. I would argue, by the way, there's a fundamental problem that Amazon has, which it doesn't know how to solve, which is it's very, a very, very good way. Online commerce, e-commerce, is a very good way to sell um, one thing to seven people or 15 people, it's not a great way to sell 15 things to one person. That's kind of Walmart, okay? And the two are not the same. Now, if you start accepting that one times seven is not the same as seven times one, one plus seven isn't necessarily the same as seven plus one, you can suddenly start solving problems creatively. Because what the multiplication is doing in your model, what the addition is doing in your model, is actually stripping out information. It's stripping out human nuance. So I was talking to the transport, uh, transport uh, ministry the other day. I said, look, you're talking about overcrowding and trains, OK? And the idea is anybody who has to stand on a train is bad. And I agree, it's kind of bad. But we're never going to produce a train network where no one has to stand. Let's look at it differently. If 10 people have to stand 10% of the time, well, it's kind of overcrowding, but meh. OK, right? I mean, all of us here, if we had to stand on a train every 10th journey, kind of, yeah, shit happens, you know, OK, whatever. If you'd bought a season ticket and you had to stand every day, you'd be livid, wouldn't you? So one person who has to stand 100% of the time is not the same psychologically. It's the same in the model, but it's not the same psychologically as 10 people who have to stand one journey in 10. Fair? Now, once you split it up like that, once you accept that commuting is not commutative, you can solve the problem in an interesting way. You say, OK, maybe what we need to do is we need to have two trains a day in each direction, which are exclusively for quarterly and annual season ticket holders. And we'll make sure that if you're on that train, you get a seat. If you want to travel on that train and you haven't got a season ticket, maybe you've got to pay a supplement. 
Now, restaurants would do this, right? If you're a really regular customer of a restaurant, they give you a better seat. Why don't railways think like restaurants? The answer is because they're looking at information in the aggregate. They're not looking at it at the personal um, disaggregated level. And so models look clever. Anything that uses maths makes you look clever. It de demolishes argument because the guy with the spreadsheet in the room always wins the argument. But the very process of adding things up and multiplying them together may be actually limiting your creative ability. Because aggregate information looks clever, but can make you act dumb. Now, what I'd like to talk about just for the remainder of this talk, I understand we're a bit ahead of time, so I'm, I'm free to ramble a little bit. I genuinely think that marketing needs to be the science of knowing what conventional logic is wrong about. Now, the problem about conventional logic in a marketing setting is if you're conventionally logical, you'll never get fired, OK? Any decision which is made based on the pretense that people are logical and rational will never get you into trouble. The only problem is that two problems. One, you might be wrong. Two, you'll often use logic and end up in exactly the same place as all your competitors. So you'll end up in the worst part of the market, which is a kind of bloodbath. Because logic tends to take you to the same place. Your logic tends to take you to the same place as other people's logic. Let me go, lovely example. You want to compete with Coca-Cola, 140 years or so. For the last 80 years, I suppose, it's been the most popular cold, non-alcoholic drink in the world, apart from water. So you're in the room, and you're Mr. Logic, and they say, what do we need to do to compete with Coke? And you say, uh, we need to produce a drink that tastes nicer than Coke, costs less than Coke, and comes in a really big can, so people get great value for money. Now, no one will kick you out of the room. If the drink you subsequently launch fails, you won't get fired for doing that. Okay? In logical terms, costs less, tastes nicer, comes in a big container, you've totally slam dunked it. The only problem is the most successful attempt to compete with Coke in 150 years is this, and it comes in a tiny can, costs a fortune, and it tastes disgusting. <laughs> okay? There probably is, by the way, a deep psychological reason for this which is if you want to believe that a drink has medicinal or psychotropic powers, it can't taste conventionally nice. With a lot of medicines, they add a shitty tasting thing to it to maximize the placebo effect. Because if Nurofen tasted like black currants, it probably wouldn't work very well. Okay? We need it to, that's, that's why people think wheatgrass is good for you. Because let's face it, you're not drinking the stuff for pleasure, are you? Okay? You could just go and lick the underside of your lawnmower and create the same effect. <laughs> But it's worth knowing that in a business, there's kind of finance department logic, there's operations logic, okay? There's what you might call air traffic control logic. Now, you want the people in operations, you want a lot of the people in a business to deploy conventional logic, which is do the same thing, best practice, optimize, maximize efficiency, all those things which make a business efficient and good. But there are certain spheres of business which shouldn't operate on the same logical precepts. HR, I'd argue, is one of them. Uh, if, you know, simply um, R&D would be another one. You know, um, you know, R&D, anything to do with experimentation and R&D. HR, because let's face it, the skill of HR is to find people that your competitors aren't finding to work for you. And marketing is a third one. Another sphere, which you're probably not involved in, is military logic has to be different from conventional logic. Why? Because if you're conventionally logical in the military, your enemy knows what you're going to do and kills you because they set a trap for you. They know what you're going to do. You become predictable. And if you become predictable, you become dead. Okay? This, if you want to over-intellectualize a joke, which is something I never really recommend, but it is a very, very funny joke and you all know it, this is essentially what's going on here. You have an ex-military man in the film Airplane. I think he's called Kramer, if I'm right. Um, and he's in charge of the control tower. He's a Korean War veteran. He's in charge of the control tower. For those of you who don't know airplane, um, uh, there's essentially a stricken airliner with a very inexperienced ex-military pilot on board who has to land sort of 200 civilians uh, after dark uh, because the pilot and the co-pilot have been taken ill. This is what happens. Maybe we ought to turn on the searchlights now. Uh oh. That's just what they'll be expecting us to do. 
Now, the point about that is you, <laughs> you don't want military logic in air traffic control. You don't want the people who tighten the wheel nuts on your plane when you next fly to be wildly creative people going, screw it, let's try anti-clockwise for the lols, okay? <clears throat> but there are spheres in business and military and governmental and political decision making where you've got to abandon conventional logic. Now, it's just about okay to have procurement people buying military hardware, okay? What you don't want is procurement people deciding military strategy. If you'd done that, they would have insisted that the D-Day landings took place between Dover and Calais to minimize fuel costs, right? The whole point of the Normandy landings was to create the expectation that that's where the landing would take place while actually planning to land somewhere much more expensive and much more difficult. All military strategy is actually the cunning deployment of wasted resources to wrong-foot an enemy. If you ever do what's most efficient, you'll come up against the most resistance. I would argue the same applies in many cases to marketing. If you try and make marketing merely efficient, you'll end up predictable and in the same place as everybody else. And the problem that we face is that finance-dominated decision-making in a business is overwhelmingly dominated by what you might call procurement logic, which is cost-cutting, maximize efficiency. The default mode of any business is essentially reduce the price of things. No one who goes into any business meeting who says, I found a way of doing X cheaper, no one will have to face any hard questioning. In some cases, the problem arises that actually marketers now suffer a kind of Stockholm syndrome where they pretend they're like procurement. And they shouldn't be doing that because marketing isn't, this, isn't that kind of thing. It doesn't use that kind of logic. Someone I knew studying for a qualification in behavioral science, they made their money doing email marketing for a large London theater chain. They discovered very quickly that, that advertising a discount on theater tickets reduced demand. Now, those of you who studied economics are going kind of does not compute. I can understand that perfectly. The fact that you're discounting the tickets suggests the play isn't all that great, right? If you think about it, going to a not very good play still costs you 140 quid after the discount. By the time you paid for babysitting and a meal out and car parking and a taxi and all that farting around. So people were less likely to go to the theatre when the tickets were advertised with a discount. So she used to tell people this. They come and say, I want you to advertise the matinee on Friday for such and such a performance, and I want you to tell people it's 25% off. And she said, I'll happily advertise the available tickets, but I won't say 25% off because it'll reduce demand and reduce the price. So you'll get yourself fewer tickets and at a lower price. And every case, the people came back and said, I want you to do it anyway. Why? You'll sell fewer tickets because my boss can't shout at me. If I pretend that economics is true, I'll never get into any trouble. Let's say I didn't sell all the tickets and I didn't put the discount on. He might say, ah, oh, but if you put the 25% discount on, economic theory tells us we would have sold more tickets, therefore we would have done a better job. So effectively, economics is basically the new IBM. No one ever gets fired for, for using it. And this is a fundamental problem, I think, with the way algorithms are designed, with the way business decisions are made, which is that basically pretending that economics is true never gets you into any trouble. Now, imagine if you wanted to go and say, I want to go and give our staff a pay rise because I find that generally jollying them up and making them happy increases the sales of our product. Let's say that was a call center, okay? You could make that case. In fact, in many, many cases, it would be absolutely true. We had a very, very good call center, one of our clients, and I asked him, how is your call center so good? Why are all the staff so brilliant? And he said, to be honest, we probably overpay them. And the reason is because they felt they were overpaid, they stayed for years, and they got really, really good at their job. Now, in order to justify that, you would probably, it would take you a year of hard argument, and you'd still probably lose. If you went into the same meeting and said, I'm going to put the staff on zero hours contracts and outsource them to somewhere else, okay, that would get through on the nod. And there's a fundamental bias in business, which is effectively towards making everything 20% uh, cheaper than consumers want it to be and 40% shittier because those business decisions are just the easiest ones to make. That's why, by the way, there are no curtains on the Eurostar, because some fucking um, scrote in procurement. Okay? You paid 280 quid. For, there are hooks for the curtains, okay? This means you can't see your laptop in the sun unless you pull the blind down, which is a bit passive-aggressive, because you share the blind with someone else. This is getting a bit Larry David here, I grant you this, okay? 
But someone pointed out that you could actually save 200,000 a year in dry cleaning costs by not having any curtains. The corresponding argument, which is curtains will make it a lot nicer and more people will come back, that's probably true, but it's much harder to prove and it's much harder to argue. So here we go. These are the assumptions of economic logic, that human behavior is objective. As I said, it isn't. Uh, we construct ideas of value and price in our heads from various cues, but it's not objective. It's not perfectly trusting. It's not proportionate. It's not ergodic, which I won't go into because it's a bloody headache. Um, it's not status-free, context-free, individualistic. It's not maximizing, and it's not path-independent. Okay. Now, look at how a restaurant gets people. How long have I got? Five minutes? Ten. Perfect. Okay. Look at how a restaurant gets people to buy wine. A restaurant wants people to buy wine because wine's very profitable. Why is wine very profitable? And the reason is that basically, anyone else agree with it? It's kind of bullshit. The whole wine thing's kind of bullshit. How many people really would really rather drink like cocktails or gin and tonic or whiskey? I think quite a lot, or beer for that matter, okay? But the great thing about wine is it's kind of bullshit. So you can't charge, you can mark up wine to a huge extent because it's bullshit, right? Okay, you can't charge 50 quid for a glass of Johnny Walker Red because people know what a bottle costs in the shops. But you can buy in a case of Chateau d'Obscure 2008 <laughs> for six euros a bottle, charge 50 euros a bottle for it, and everyone will crap on about the scent of black currants and all that sort of bollocks, okay? Because that's what you're expected to do. So restaurants really want you to order wine. They manipulate you every single time, okay? It's total manipulation. First of all, when you come into the restaurant, there are already wine glasses on the table, which kind of say this is the kind of establishment which expects you to drink wine. If indeed you say we're not drinking wine, they take them away with a bit of a huff, have you noticed? Okay? Then they bring you a drinks list, which isn't called a drinks list, it's called the wine list. And the choice architecture of the wine list is you have four pages of a totally insane and ridiculous range of different kinds of red, white, and rosé wine. And then like this grotty little back page for the perverts and deviants who'd actually prefer, who'd prefer to drink something produced by a culture that's mastered brewing or distillation, right? <laughs> Rather than just trampling on grapes and leaving them to go off. <laughs> All right? So you feel you have to. Now, but there's even cleverer, an even cleverer piece of manipulation than this, which is they only hand out one wine list. So the guy with the wine list, I'm sorry, I'm terribly sorry, the lady here is French, so I'm, I, she's probably having a heart attack at this <laughs> assault on her national, I'm so sorry. Anyway. Um, but there's only one wine list. Now, if you think about it, there's only one drink that you can kind of share among everybody, unless you want to say tequila slammers all round which you probably wouldn't in this kind of venue, right? So the guy with the wine list turns to the table, and what does he do? He says, red or white? At which point, it's game over for the gin drinkers, the beer drinkers. They're forced to go along with everybody else. Now, you think you've chosen to drink red wine, but actually, the whole choice architecture has been fundamentally geared up to flog you wine. Now, by contrast, Let's look at something, that, that's the product of years of genius in how to run a profitable restaurant. Let's look at something else. Let's look at how we choose flights. Now, not hotels, okay? Now, no, I think it's fair to say, nobody when they book a hotel goes online to Trivago or whatever and goes, I want to stay in Barcelona for three nights, what's the cheapest hotel? Do you? you don't do that because you'd end up in some rat-infested place, right? So hotel choosing online is a bit nuanced. But what they do with an airline, is they make the only salient thing by which you can choose price. In fact, if you're an airline that said, I'd like to be 10% better, have a bit more leg room, and we'll charge everybody 10% more, you'd probably disappear off page one or two of the search rankings, and you go bankrupt. Even though, on balance, lots of people would probably prefer that trade-off. So there's a very important thing. Daniel Kahneman, who's the first um, economist, or fir uh, first psychologist to win the Nobel Prize for Economics, he made the point that his, his most important discovery in his life is nothing is as important as you think it is while you're thinking about it. What you're looking at and what is salient becomes important because you're paying attention to it. When you go, I, I, I pointed this out to British Airways. I said, look, 
The way you get people onto the 12 o'clock flight rather than the 10 o'clock flight is exclusively by dropping the price of the less popular flight. But I pointed out in one case, I said, look, the 12 o'clock flight's got a brand new 787 Dreamliner on it, okay? But I can only discover that by clicking, by mousing over one thing, then clicking on it, then clicking on something else. Now, that plane's cost them 150 million pounds, right? But in my actual choosing, it does, it's not even visible. You know, the fact whether there's Wi-Fi or not isn't visible. You can use loads and loads of things to get people to change their behavior as well as the price mechanism. But when you make price the dominant thing, people automatically will choose on price. Now, I think the airline industry is killing itself through choice architecture. Now, I don't know how many other people have done this. I've done it myself, okay, just to be clear. So you've got a family of four. You're leaving Gatwick to go somewhere on EasyJet, you know, in like five weeks' time. And there are various flights, and you see that one of the flights is 10 quid cheaper than the three other flights going to the same destination that day. And there are four of you, so you multiply it by four and go, bloody hell, saving 40 quid, I've got to do that, fantastic. So you book it. And then two days before you travel, you have a look at what you've booked again. And you realize it's the bloody 6 a.m. flight. Have you, anybody else done this? And then a day before, you go, shit, there's no way I'm going to get the family out of bed at 3.30 in the morning. So you end up booking a hotel the night before and having a meal in Pizza Express, which costs you about 200 quid, which completely eradicates the 40 quid you save by choosing the 6 a.m. flight. But at the time you chose, that was the salient factor. Now, if airlines can't find other things to advertise, you know, I, I, one of the things I've said is you've got to make choice architecture here more multidimensional. You've got to have, you know, maybe the midday flight has, you know, two kids for the price of one. You know, maybe the one o'clock flight says free Wi-Fi on this flight. Maybe one flight says take this flight and get a free upgrade to premium economy on the way back. But you've got to mess with the choice to not make it all about money, because otherwise the entire world's airline industry is just involved in a massive race to the bottom simply because of the way they present choice to, the way, to, to people who are choosing a flight. Now, I'm just, to, just to make this point, if you want to buy a really, if you want to buy art, don't buy art, buy architecture, okay? Because the way we choose a house is we go, where is it? How much does it cost? How many bedrooms has it got? Has it got a garden? Has it got a greenhouse? And then we narrow it down and we look at five houses and we choose the one we like the look of most, right? Now, I did it backwards. I said, let's look for a fantastic house architecturally first and then worry about the other stuff. I ended up in a flat in a Robert Adam grade one listed house. There are only 2,000 grade one listed houses in Britain. Well, it's about, about a th in which you can conceivably live. I mean, some of them like the Royal Opera House and Nelson's Column, okay? My neighbor's an economist. I said, how much extra do we pay for the fact that this is a Robert Adam house? He said, somewhere between naught and 2%. <laughs> now, you don't pay 2% extra for a Picasso versus some crappy thing done by a guy on the Bayswater Road. But if you bought art the way we bought architecture, that's what would happen, okay? If people went, if people went, if art websites were like property websites, you went, I want a painting that's about five by three. Um, I wanted to be painted in the south of France. I wanted to feature two cows and maybe a tree. And I'd like it to be mostly green, but with a bit of blue. And then the bloke said, here are five of them. And he said, I'll have that one, right? In those conditions, Picassos would be really, really cheap. So the order of elimination of attribute has a huge effect on the actual decisions people make. And the airline industry is effectively trying to commit suicide because of choice architecture. This is getting a bit better. Okay, at least they say what the plane is and the fact that there's Wi-Fi on it. Um, another interesting thing, by the way, in terms of why, by the way, first class is cheaper than business class, God only knows, but their algorithm's clearly gone a bit wonky. Two very vital things for the last five minutes, okay? One of which is the Every model of human decision-making assumes that people are trying to maximize. It assumes they're trying to optimize something. Economists call the thing they're trying to optimize utility, okay? I would argue this makes no sense given that our brain is the product of evolution and given that we've evolved to live in a world of uncertain information. Now, let me just explain that very quickly, okay? Um, the reason, by the way, that finance tends to hate marketing 
is because finance is very heavily influenced by economics. Economics assumes perfect trust and perfect information in every decision. So in the mind of someone in finance or in the mind of an economist, in their perfect world model, advertising shouldn't exist at all because consumers would already know exactly what they wanted and how much they're prepared to pay for it. Okay. That's why finance tends to hate marketing, because it sees it as a cost to be minimized, not as a source of value creation. Because they don't really accept subjective value. They don't really understand it. Similarly, economists assume we're trying to maximize something. Now, let's be clear. There are decisions like archery where it's all about maximization. You aim for the bullseye, okay? You aim for the bullseye. It doesn't matter if you can't see, if you're drunk, if, you're, if it's windy. You go for the bullseye. Why do you go for the bullseye? Because there's no better strategy in archery. Because if you just miss the 10, you get a 9. If you just miss the 9, you get an 8. If you just miss the 8, you get a 7, okay? That's a maximization problem where the only logical strategy is aim for the 10. I would argue, by the way, that's why archery has never made it big as a televised sport to be absolutely honest, because there are no trade-offs. I mean, if you're an archery commentator, it must go something like this. You're, so, Barry, what do you think he's going to do next? Um, well, John, I think he's going to aim for the fucking 10 like he's done for the previous 500 bloody goes, right? Because there's nothing else you can do, OK? Archery is not an interesting sport. Darts, by contrast, now, Apologies, by the way, French lady here. I gave this presentation in France. Fine place, France, very good food. Not a great darting nation, it has to be said. <laughs> and for this section of the presentation, they were completely baffled. But darts are actually quite interesting. If you're not very good at art, darts, aim for the southwestern quadrant of the board. Because you won't get a triple 20 that way, well, unless you're really bad, but you won't get a one or a five. When there's a messier outcome to a decision, when there's a degree of uncertainty to a decision, you have to consider two things. You have to consider the average, but you have to consider the variation as well. You have to consider the variance. Got that? Now, because the human brain has evolved to make decisions that are much more like darts than they are like archery, you know, like, do I climb an extra 10 feet up that tree to get the extra cherries, even though there's a small risk I could die, okay, by falling, okay? Those are the kind of messy, uncertain decisions that we've evolved to make. And we have to consider both. How good is it on average is not enough. Because if it's really, really good on average, but one time in 10, it's fatal, OK? Then we don't want to do that. We'll take a trade-off. We'll have something that's less good on average, but has lower variance. So it's never going to be terrible. That's why I would argue, um, I, 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 I'll, I'll just flip through to the next slide if I can first. Uh, that's why McDonald's is the most successful restaurant in the world. It's not because it's really, really good. It's because it's really, really good at not being awful. An awful lot of human behavior is driven by this. It's not only asking the question, how good is this thing optimally? It's also asking, what's the worst that can happen? And if what's the worst that can happen, even if there's a very low probability of something bad happening, but if that bad thing is very, very bad, we won't take the bite, OK? You can see that in people's behavior on things like eBay. It only takes one really dodgy thing, like really bad grammar in the listing, you know, two recent complaints from people. Now, logically, okay, if we were a logical species on eBay, if someone had a 95% approval rating, okay, they should be able to sell their products for 5% less than someone with a 100% approval rating. Fair? Because they're 5% unreliable. Actually, what happens is if someone's got a 95 or a 90% approval rating, they sell the bloody products for about a third of the price, or they can't sell them at all, OK? There's, there's that uncertainty thing at all. There's too much variance in there now. I don't want it. That, I would argue, is why people pay a premium for brands. Not because they think brands are better, but because they think they're less likely to be shite. OK? This is a cat showing exactly the same thing. It's asking, there's not much chance of this worst thing happening, but if it is the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario is really bad. So OK, I'll just hit play there. It's a cucumber. Put it outside your cat's line of sight. Wait, and there you go. <laughs> OK? There's not much chance it's a snake, but why take the risk? OK? There probably were, it's green, it's got a pointy nose, it's low to the ground. There probably were cats in early and evolutionary history who were calibrated the other way around. They went, cool, look at that cute little cucumber. Oh, shit, it's a snake. Those cats tended to exit the gene pool, if you get my drift, right? 
Now, so most cats are descended from the slightly paranoid cat. By the way, this affects human behavior to such an extent that when you have penalty kicks to decide uh, football competitions, even like the World Cup, two minutes? Three, okay, super. Okay, people would score more, they'd get a higher average if they kicked the ball straight down the middle. Not everybody, obviously, but some of them. The reason they don't is although you're more likely to score, you look much stupider if you fail. If you kick the ball left and the guy saves it, kick the ball right and the guy saves it, you look unlucky. Kick the ball down the middle and the guy saves it, you're more likely to score, he's less likely to save it, because his propensity is to dive. But if he does save it, standing in the middle, you look really useless, like you didn't even try. That drives nearly all business decision making. Fear of the negative is a much more powerful force than desire for the positive. And it can lead to business decision making, which is dangerous. Uh, we also discovered, by the way, in drinks context for Diageo, there is no way you will ever sell a man a cocktail unless the menu contains an illustration or a picture of the glass in which it's to be served. Because if the male brain thinks there's a 0.05% chance it arrives looking like that, he'll order a beer instead. Okay? <laughs> exactly like the cat. Okay? Now, I'll end on one final thing, because this is important. Okay? There's what you can measure. Now, in digital advertising, what's easiest to measure? Answer, it's a purchase or transaction or a click from a message that is highly, that is very, very close to the point of purchase. Fair? Okay? I would like to argue that a significant part of marketing must rely on doing the opposite of this. Let me explain in very simple terms. You go to a car dealership and the bloke buys you a cup of tea, right? Now, you don't go, what an incredibly generous bloke. He's just made me a cup of tea. This is fantastic. What amazing customer service. Because he's trying to sell you a car, right? It doesn't really instill trust because the cars cost 20 grand and the tea bag costs 2p, right? Now, if on the other hand you buy a car from the guy and a week later he rings you up and says, you forgot the logbook, I'll drop it off at your house on my way home this evening, you go, wow, that's really cool, right? Because the first is self-interested and nakedly short-termist. The second gesture is patently long-termist because he isn't going to be selling you another car for three years. Now, the meaning and the, what's easy to measure and what has meaning to consumers may be very different. Now, explain this. Bit of game theory, okay? Generally, people are honest, decent, and nice, and this applies to relationships with brands just as relationships with other people, to the extent they expect future interactions. A lot of altruism is basically long-term selfishness. It's worth me being nice to this guy because I'm playing the long game. And people who are playing the long game who are looking to actually engage in a series of repeated non-zero-sum transactions over time tend to be decent and trustworthy. People who just want to flog you something and then disappear, we don't trust those people. I would argue that an extensive part of marketing is doing things that only pay off in the long term. Now, the way we'd signal trustworthiness to another human whether it is by doing things that involve effort now or cost now, which will only pay off over a series of repeated interactions, because that shows we're playing the long cooperative game, not the one-off cheaty game. And so I'll end with this, just to be clear, how much of marketing, now the problem is, is those things by definition are the hardest thing to measure, and they're the things that every algorithm will miss because the payoff may come three years hence. An example of a generosity post-purchase would be when you spend 200 pounds on cosmetics or women's fashion, they have to give you a rope-handled bag, don't they? It's not better than the polythene bag, it's just more expensive. It says, we're not stingy here, we're giving you a proper bag, okay? Now, measuring the efficacy of the rope-handled bag would be really, really difficult because the only time it will show up might be two years or three years hence or six months hence. The effectiveness of the cup of tea is really easy to measure, but the meaning is inversely proportionate to the ease of measurement. That is really costly long-term signaling. Upfront expense as proof of long-term intention, okay? You wouldn't buy an engagement ring if you're only planning a one-night stand. There are cheaper alternatives, I imagine, okay? <laughs> right? If you notice, 
An engagement ring also has to cost an amount that is actually painful to the man buying it. Doesn't matter how rich you are, it has to involve actual pain as a sincere gesture that I, I am entering into this arrangement on the clear and proven expectation that it has a long-term future, not a short-term expedient. Um, you, know, you know what that's called, don't you? Right, okay. Similarly, five guys giving you extra fries. Okay, that's after you've bought the fries, they give you an extra scoop, which is above and beyond the, uh, the, the, the scoop that fills the cup. Again, that's long-term signaling. The fact that Selfridges sends you your stuff from selfridges.com in much, much better packaging than you have any reason to expect, that's long-term signaling. My hunch is a very, very large part of marketing and particularly the establishment of trust involves a behavior which by definition is very difficult to measure. And by focusing more and more marketing budgets, not on where they're effective, but where you can prove they're effective, there's the danger that we're misdirecting investment dangerously. But that's my final bit of advice. Avoid conventional logic because your competitors will all use that. Test counterintuitive things because your competitors won't. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.